America is a breeding ground for strange, unexplained creatures and unsolved disappearances. Are the two connected? Probably. America is often quite the nightmare world when it comes to mysterious phenomenon and creepy critters. So I've got a goodie bag of stories today featuring terrifying creatures seen in the Midwest United States. Here's to hoping you wore your thickest pair of undies today. If you have a story of your own, be sure to share it with us at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. Something in the Woods from Ron R. This happened in the fall of 2000 in Indiana. Me and a friend named Jim decided to go camping in the woods behind his grandparents' farm. So that Friday, Jim and I set out to his grandparents to do our yearly camp out. Once we arrived, we unloaded the truck and started down the trail out in the back part of the yard. We hiked for about an hour or so before we got to our camping spot. Once there, we did all the normal things like setting up the tent, gathering firewood. Later in the night, Jim and I sat by the fire, talking about the school year, discussing Jim's nut job of a girlfriend that he had, before finally calling it a night. We were in the tent for about two hours. I was on the brink of sleep. It usually takes me a while. When suddenly something rammed into the side of our tent wall, Jim woke right up, looking like he had just soiled himself. We both looked at one another, wondering what the heck had just happened. We sat there for a couple of minutes, waiting to see if it would happen again. But it didn't. Eventually, we calmed down, thinking maybe I was falling asleep and accidentally kicked the tent wall or something. We laid back down and passed out, Later on that night, it happened again. Something hit the tent. This time, instead of just sitting there with dumb looks on our faces, I told Jim to grab his hunting knife and I grabbed the 22 that I brought along. I began to open the tent, then poked my head out, scanning the perimeter to see if there was anything outside. When I was satisfied that it was clear, I climbed out of the tent quietly and began to walk around, circling the camp. Jim followed closely behind. While looking around, I heard what sounded like twigs snapping under someone's footsteps. I began to walk in the direction of those sounds, which seemed to be coming from deeper in the pitch black forest. We walked in for about 30 minutes before heading back to camp. When we got back, we were dumbfounded. The camp was in shambles. Our tent had been thrown across the campsite. Our supplies had been tossed around and torn to shreds. It looked like someone or something had been looking for something. Being hot-headed teens, we cleaned up the campsite and set the tent back up. We went back to bed for the night, though we were attentive, on the lookout for any other sounds. I woke up just before dawn to branches falling to the ground in large thuds. I sat there for some time, listening closely. After a bit, I assumed that it was just the wind. Not even five minutes later, something came rushing out of the woods, smacking the rods of the tent so hard, they were flung out of the ground and broken in half. These were metal rods, and when we found them, they looked more like they had been broken in two, like toothpicks. After this happened, the tent fell on top of us. I panicked and grabbed the 22, trying to escape through the door of the tent when something suddenly hit me, knocking me on my rear and right on top of Jim. Not knowing what was going on, Jim grabbed his hunting knife and blindly slashed the side of the tent. In a panic, we both made our way out of the new opening making a mad dash for his grandparents' farmhouse. It seemed like it took forever to finally get there, but when we saw the porch light, we busted through the door and locked it behind us. 
That morning, Jim's grandpa looked at us and said, What, you guys too scared to stay out there all night? We told him what happened and what we heard. He grabbed a shotgun and we all headed back to the camp to check it out. Once we got back, everything was destroyed worse than before. While looking around, I heard Jim call my name with a trembling voice. I ran over and stopped right in my tracks. What he was looking at was the tent, which was covered in blood and fur, exactly in the area Jim had slashed the new opening in the tent. Jim had apparently attacked our attacker. Judging by the fur and the footprints we found, even his grandpa had trouble figuring out what in the world had attacked us that night. We gathered everything we could that was intact. We went back to the farmhouse, and we were told to not camp in those woods again. It followed me from Lake Erie, from Joel P. When I was around 10, my grandpa took me to Lake Erie with two of my friends. We went to the beach's edge and started swimming. Then before long, we went to fish with my grandpa. I threw in my line and got a bite really fast. But whatever it was was too big for me and my friends together to pull out. It ended up snapping the pole. I apologized to my grandpa, as it was one of his more expensive poles. He said it was fine. Wasn't my fault, after all. Then he went on to say that he had never seen something break a pole like that. We stayed there fishing until it closed. After a while, my friends went swimming again, leaving my grandpa to fish for a bit. We dared one of my friends to go out to the six-foot deep zone. He went in, then challenged us to go deeper. I took his challenge, showing him that I wasn't a coward. The moment I passed him, I felt something touch my leg. I thought it was him, the friend that went out into the six foot deep water, but he was already swimming back when I turned around and the thing was still touching my leg. I began to thrash it about, thinking that it was a snake. It went away without a problem. Around that time, my grandpa shouted at us to get out and dry off. It was almost dark and he was ready to go back. By the time we made it back to the car, it was dark. I got the passenger side seat, while the guys sat in the back. It was a suburban though, so it was quite roomy. As we began to leave, I looked back the lake, and I saw something in the water. Something was disturbing it, and was slowly emerging from it. I wasn't sure what it was. It wasn't a fish. It looked more like some sort of mammal crawling out of it, but I couldn't get a good look. This is where things get really weird. Five weeks later, one of those friends has constant nightmares, keeps telling his parents that there's something in the water. It gets so bad that his parents end up moving so that they could be further away from the lake because their son suddenly had an awful fear of it out of nowhere. Before he left, he gave me his number so that we could talk, stay in touch. Not long after he left, he called me for the first time. It even came up in my phone as the number he had saved for me. But when I answered the phone, all I heard was breathing. This happened on several occasions. It was awful because I never actually got to talk to him again. When I stopped receiving calls from his number, something else began. Nightmares. Nightmares of being back at the lake, watching something inhuman slowly crawl out of the water and stare right back at me. I would wake up from these dreams out of breath. And the strangest, most terrifying part was that my face would be wet wet with cold, dirty water with sediment. If I had to compare it to something, it would be lake water. I've no idea what we saw in the lake, and luckily the nightmares soon faded. 
but I don't think I'll ever be able to explain what I saw or how in the world I got a lake water and sediment on my face and the privacy of my locked room. It doesn't make any sense. Just remember, if you're out fishing at Lake Erie, be careful what you catch because you might bring it back with you and not even know it. It was playing with us from Anonymous. A couple of years back, my friend Jack and I went on a road trip, starting out in Boise, Idaho, and ending at my relative's house in Michigan. We would stay there for a couple of weeks before heading home again. We took it slow, stopping at all sorts of oddball roadside attractions and campsites before we finally reached my cousin's place. Once there, we passed the time normally, swimming, playing with my cousin's kids, taking hikes, and holding bonfires. One night, Jack suggested we go on a night hike to get some peace away from the noise and clutter of the house, the opportunity to knock back a couple of beers in silence. It was a perfect summer night after all. The crickets and fireflies were out in full force, and I was in the mood to goof around in the woods so I readily agreed. We set off around 11 o'clock, hefting a bag chock full of the finest junk food and beer, courtesy of my cousin's pantry and fridge. We hiked along the trail. We talked and joked without any concern for how loud we were being. After all, for all we knew, we were alone in the woods. It was just us, some beer, and some squirrels. Nothing dangerous was living out here near my cousins. Or at least, we thought. As we continued down a trail, Jack came to a sudden halt. He turned around to look at me, eyes wide open. I asked him what was up. He said he saw some movement in the distance, something big. I laughed at him but he smacked my arm and told me that he was completely serious, no joking. I told him that maybe it was a bear, that he should just relax. All we had to do was make some noise and keep a lookout, and it would probably not come any closer. Everything would be fine. Jack looked skeptical, but began to walk on anyway. We kept on going down the trail, but as we rounded a bend up ahead, my blood went cold in my veins. There in the middle of the trail ahead of us stood a massive thing covered in thick black fur. It had to be at least seven feet tall, with a body like a man and a head more akin to a wolf, maybe a German shepherd. It stared down at us, teeth bared in almost a grin. Jack and I glanced at each other briefly, and in that moment, we had one shared thought. Run. At the same time, Jack and I turned and bolted back down the trail as fast as we possibly could. The creature gave chase, though, and it was keeping pace with us easily, always at our side. Obviously, if it wanted to, it could leap out and take us, grab us at any second. We sprinted for what seemed like forever. We were out of breath and in pain. I desperately wanted to drop to my knees, but I knew it would mean my end. Finally, we saw the trail open up into one of the fields, and we broke through. Though the creature had stopped at the edge of the woods, we kept running all the way back to my cousin's place. We burst through the front door and collapsed to the ground. My cousin and his wife panicked, coming to see what this sudden commotion was about. But I couldn't get a word in as I had broken down crying. When we calmed down, we tried to tell them what had happened to us, but no one believed us. Jack and I spent the entire night huddled together. We kept the blinds down and the windows and doors locked. We kept an eye on the outside through the blinds. 
Whatever that thing was, we were still in shock just at the sight of it. That's how unnatural it looked. And we didn't want to risk it getting inside if it was still curious as to where we were. Curious is the only way I can describe it because it didn't seem to want to attack us, though I'm sure it could change its mind at a moment's notice. The following morning, we cut the vacation short, making a quick, almost non-stop trip back home. I didn't want to stick around long enough for the thing to get closer to us. Jack and I didn't talk about it for a few weeks, and after some thinking, I really do think it's some sort of werewolf or dogman. Heck, there's so many sightings of the thing all over the US. I'm starting to think they're real, especially after seeing something like it in person. As for what it wanted with us, who knows? Maybe it wanted to hurt us, eat us, or just to drive us away from its territory. But Jack and I have another theory. Maybe it's the kind of thing that enjoys savoring the looks of terror on its prey's faces getting some sort of sick pleasure out of watching us run from it in futility. It was playing with us like a cat would do to a tiny defenseless mouse. There was something with us from Fred Bear Logics. It was late October in northern rural Indiana. I was out hunting with a friend, raccoon hunting. I'll call my friend Buddy for this story. It was around 11 p.m. and we had been to a couple of different wooded spots with no luck, so we decided to go to a new area of the forest, one that we only recently got permission to hunt at. This was a pretty remote stretch of woods compared to the others, well off the road. There were very few houses around, maybe within half a mile. It's the kind of woods that if you hit a rough spot, you're gonna be in big trouble because it's gonna be hard to get back out of there. Everything seemed typical. We pulled back a mile long lane parked in the field and got out and let the dog out. We sat and joked around for a bit, waiting for the dog to call out saying that she had one treed. A good half hour goes by and no report from the dog. We were beginning to assume our bad luck was still going until we heard barking. She must have treed one and it was in the worst place. She sounded pretty far off. Buddy and I sucked it up and grabbed our gear, starting to walk in her direction. We were hoping we could take a somewhat straight path through the woods. Once we got in deeper, we realized these woods had been logged it was logged right in a swamp, and we both groaned, deciding neither of us felt like climbing through a swamp full of downed trees. What a pain. Well, we turned around heading back for the field, following the exterior of the woods. Hopefully, we could get back to the dog this way. If not, we'd have to go back to the truck and drive over to where we could get her in, and that's only if we could get the truck in the woods somehow. So we walked for another hour, jumping over a couple of fences and crossing a stream. Eventually, we got around the swamp on the back side of the woods. To our surprise, the dog was only 20 or 30 yards inside the woods from the field we were in. This was good after such a long walk. However, neither of us knew what was about to happen. We didn't know. We were about to be more scared than we'd ever been. The dog was near a big tree with two raccoons up on the top of it. Finally, I thought. The two of us were definitely excited to see that. I took the dog away from the tree and stood about ten yards away as my buddy was trying to shoot the raccoons. I stood there for a moment and I began to hear noises. Now, if you're a hunter or have ever spent any real time in the woods, then you know you hear noises. But the noise I was hearing was walking. Footsteps from something that walked on two legs. Another person. All this time, I hadn't said a word to Buddy about the noises, 
and we were standing far enough from each other that we really couldn't see one another all that well. Between shining my light in the tree to help him out and then shining in the direction I'd been hearing the noises, I'm sure we were both confused. But he wasn't paying any attention to me or the noises. He was too focused on the tree and the raccoons. After what felt like forever, we had one coon on the ground and we were trying to get the other. But as he stopped for a moment to bag the first coon, he began to back away from the tree. I was continuing to shine my light in his direction. All the while, the noises were getting louder and closer, and I think he was beginning to hear them as well. There was this eerie chill in the woods, and in a slow wave, all the noises in the forest began to die down. I wasn't really creeped out until Buddy stopped everything he was doing and looked right at the noise's source. He stopped completely, just standing there and looking. And then he yelled out, Hello! My heart sank. At that moment, I knew this wasn't just noises you hear in the woods. Buddy was seeing something, and it was close. Close enough to make him think that we were not alone. I was petrified from that moment on. Buddy looked over to me. All I could say to him was, you've been hearing it too. He nodded, walking over to me steadily so that we were side by side, staring in that direction for several minutes. The walking would start and stop for a long time. Buddy then yelled out hello again, trying to get a reply out of our guest. But they didn't reply. The only response he would get was the footsteps would stop for a moment, but eventually continue. Buddy said he was going to get the other coon as fast as possible so we could get the heck out of here. But as he approached the tree again, whatever was making those noises began to growl. A belly deep growl. A growl that not only came from ahead of us, but a tree's height above us. How could it be in the trees yet be walking around? How tall was this thing? You wouldn't need to guess to know that we ran like heck out of there. The moment we broke into a sprint with our dog, branches began to snap off the trees like they were fragile number two pencils rather than tree branches. We made it back to our vehicle and left at record speed. We later on told some friends about what happened. We came back with other people several times, but never found or saw what made those noises. I guess it's a riddle now, whatever that thing was. What could be as tall as a tree, but walk like a man and growl like an animal? Harry Prowler from Getty 71 In 1980, I was nine or 10 years old. This experience was quite harrowing, and my family did not realize anything out of the ordinary at the time, thinking that the person we encountered was just a bad person. But that turned out not to be the case. This happened in Geauga County, Ohio. We lived in an old farmhouse with an even older barn on five acres. My mom, my stepdad, my aunt, Two of my cousins, my sister, and I were there. Dad was at work on a second shift, and my mom had the car. She took us kids, minus the male cousin about my age, to a movie. I think it was a Friday around 8 p.m. Dad would be off around 11. So we got home after that around dusk. We went inside, via the door that opens to the kitchen toward the back of the house only to be greeted by my aunt spinning on her heel at us with my old man's Marlin 30-30. The hammer was back on a loaded chamber, and her eyes were wide with terror. My mom shouted at her, Whoa, what happened? My aunt said that some burglar or prowler was outside the house. Our neighborhood was sub-rural. We had a prowler incident that ended in four deputies and a huge German shepherd catching the guy in our backyard the previous fall. So obviously, so fresh to that experience, we thought this was a repeat. A couple of seconds later, 
dry leaves began to crunch underfoot outside the kitchen window as this so-called prowler began to walk away from the house. My mother hurried into the master bedroom off the kitchen to grab the other rifle. My mom and aunt burst out of the side door as undergrowth and twigs were being rustled in a hurry by this prowler. By then, the rest of us had been ordered into hiding in a closet, and we were already there, waiting to see what would happen. When we heard the rifles both opening fire, I ran out of the front of the house and around the driveway to see if my mom and aunt were okay. My mom was hysterical, shouting quite a blue streak as she emptied the 22 into the woodline. I could see the silhouette of the individual who was running away. When my mother stopped firing, I could hear the guy's extremely heavy footfalls as he ran through the undergrowth, ivy, deadfall, and vines, but he ran with such ease as if everything in his way was just air. When the figure disappeared, the police arrived later, and we all gathered round to hear my aunt's story. My aunt had apparently been reading a novel in the living room in a chair right next to one of those old big windows that start close to the floor and go almost to the ceiling. She looked up at one point and was absolutely horrified to see a face in the window. This sent her flying to get the 30 30 You see, that side of the house was, you could probably guess, against the wood line. And in order for a man's face to appear in that window that way, he would either have to be standing on something, which we never found, or he was over eight feet tall. And from his footprints, this man was obviously barefoot and had some feet that were absolutely huge. As for the shootout, my mother and aunt didn't hit the thing directly, but what the police did recover instead of blood was chunks of fur, dark brown, which obviously would not appear on a person. Fast forward to early fall that same year. I'm on the front door stoop on a gorgeous warm day, reading a book on Sasquatch for a book report I was doing. I think it may have been one of Bob Gimlin's books. My aunt comes out the front door to summon me for dinner, and she stopped cold in her tracks. She sat down next to me, almost in shock. The book was open to a page with a very good artist's rendering of a Sasquatch bust. She pointed to it and told me that that face was almost perfectly similar to the one she saw in the window. It was only after she said this that I closed the book and she got a look at the title. I remember her saying under her breath, no way. She made me swear not to tell anyone and to this day, only a few select family members know, and we all believe her. The Prowler was no man. It was something much bigger and covered in fur. Do you live in the Midwest? Well, you better start packing. From what I hear, ending up as human beef jerky for Sasquatches or bizarre predators in the Midwest United States isn't too comfy. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you want to support the show, check the links below to send us your story, or to donate, or to shop in our merch store. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode about five small town horror stories. I500IK's channel says, as the song goes, hate lives in a small town. That's a creepy thing to say in a song that I've never heard. Homer Mickey A says, I'm from a small town, and we are the things that go bump in the night. So what you're saying is people in small towns can't keep it in their pants at night. Gotcha. Ronald C says, What up, bro? How life? It good, it good. Tony Knight says, I live on the outskirts of a small village. Maybe there's some spooky stuff going on. Maybe it's time to investigate. Good luck, and I hope you bring your body armor. And Valer says, your voice is a mix of ASMR and unsettling. Well, in my view, creepy can be pretty comfy. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode, but don't you worry, 
more scary stories are on the way soon. Until next time, here are the credits to my patrons who continue to donate. They're very incredible people. Now, remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.